because whatever we've been told is not working. I remember in the 60s, you know, people in the streets with signs, politicking against everything. You know, in the 40s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, you had teenagers and you had uh, young adults that respected authority. And so even though they saw, saw the faults of these systems, they didn't revolt. But in the 60s, there was an anti-authoritarian movement, and they revolted against everything. You name it, they politicked against it. Corruption in, 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 in school systems, in colleges, corruption in politics, corruption in the corporate world. They griped and complained about everything. But they had no solutions. We're worse off today than we were back then. You know, if you've ever seen, uh, was it Tom Brokaw's The Greatest Generation? At one point, he got about 15, 20 of those people, those ex-hippies that were now in their 40s and 50s, who did all that politicking and all, all that revolting in the 60s. And he just asked him at the end of the interview, have you made anything better? And they all had to say, no. It doesn't help to gripe and complain. That doesn't help. And even today, to look at the evil and gripe and complain about the evil, that doesn't help. I'm glad we recognize it. I'm glad we're not a part of it. But what's the solution? What is the source of evil today? The source of evil today is, number one, humankind. Evil is resident in every non-believer. It is ruling and it is reigning in every non-believer. They are part of the structure, part of the system that is tearing everything apart. The other part of evil, the other part of the source of evil is demonic. There are demons. Satan is alive and well on planet Earth, and his demons are working everywhere. The book of Revelation is where demons and humankind come together in mass and work corporately to overtake the world and to shut God out, to persecute God's people, to persecute believers, and to push God out of the sphere of all human existence. And I don't mean to be crass. That's why in Revelation, you have literally hell on earth. You have demons ruling and reigning. Now, in Revelation 12 last week, we started to look at this beast that was over this evil system. Let's read through the first six verses of Revelation chapter 12. Going to be a little bit of review. And then I want to build upon it by going back into Daniel. Daniel helps us to understand this beast. And we're going to read more in specific about this man called the Antichrist. I don't know if you realize it. You know, there's a good possibility the Antichrist is going to be homosexual. Did you know that? Good possibility. I'll show you in the book of Daniel. The Bible says Could be. Could be. I'm making it. Well, it could be. It's possible to be a transsexual. I don't know. But I'll show you in Daniel when we get there. But let's read verses uh, 1 through 6 in chapter 12. A great sign. A megas semeon, a great sign took place in heaven. There was a woman. She was clothed with sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Who's this woman? She cried out. She was with child, being in labor. She was in pain about ready to give birth. She was in agony. And there was another sign. This would be our second sign protagonist in the well i guess the woman would be the protagonist this next sign this beast would be the antagonist another sign verse three appeared in heaven and behold a great huge megos again large red dragon murderous dragon red stands for murder this beast this dragon had seven heads and ten horns on his heads were seven diadems or crowns and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them down to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. She gave birth to the son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to, who, to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness, and she had, where she had, a place prepared by God so that she might be nourished for 1,260 days. 
Now, as we said before, this chapter is part of a parenthesis. When you come to chapter 11, verse 15, you have the seventh trumpet. That seventh trumpet blows, but as you know, we have three series of seven judgments in Revelation, seals, trumpets, and bowls. The seventh seal are the seven the seventh seal are the seven trumpets. The seventh trumpet are the seven bowl judgments. So in eleven fifteen you have the seventh trumpet, which is the unleashing of the seven bowls, but that seven that seven bowls doesn't start to open until chapter sixteen, verse one. So chapter twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen are a parentheses. And they can be confusing because I've said before, Revelation is a book you wouldn't take in college until your senior year. It's a 401 class. You have to have 101, 201, and 301, freshman, sophomore, and junior, before you can take a senior class. This is the senior class. It presupposes, you know, Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all those prophets. It presupposes all of that. And what we're looking at here is a very telescopic, telescopic view of prophecy. And what, what I mean by that is prophecy oftentimes, when you're talking about what's going on in chapter 12, we have huge gaps in here. We have huge time frames of gaps the writer doesn't even mention. He mentions a woman. He mentions a dragon. He mentions the woman, the dragon's going to persecute the woman, and he mentions the woman fleeing into the wilderness. Folks, these are thousands of years apart. But we're looking at mountaintop experiences, highlights in the book of, of uh, well, all of the Bible, all of redemptive history. And that's why it presupposes you have enough Bible knowledge from Genesis to understand who the woman was. You have enough knowledge to understand who this seven-headed beast is. You have enough knowledge to understand who this child is and all of that. And why would this woman flee into the wilderness? Well, Zechariah 14 explains all of that. And later on in chapter 12, that will be explained also. But that's what can make Revelation so difficult. You have to have this breadth of knowledge. And if you don't, I encourage you to sit under somebody who does. And people will always say, well, what eschatology do I adopt? Do I adopt the pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, mid-rath, pre-rath, uh, all-mill, post-mill, pre-mill? Who do I believe? Because the average layperson doesn't have thousands and thousands of hours to comb through these books in the original languages and systematize all of this. And this is always my counsel for young Christians and even anybody who wants to study eschatology. Pick the guy who, who has a godly lifestyle that you respect. And pick a man who every time he does preach on a, a passage that you are very familiar with, he nails it. He nails it. He gets it right. Because if he gets the things right that you can authenticate, that you can check, he's probably doing a pretty good job when it comes to eschatology. Adopt his eschatology and stay with it. And then as you read through the Bible, if you ever see verses that contradict that eschatology, then you know you have to change your eschatology. I preached through Revelation for five years in my last church. I only got up to chapter 20, and everybody said, that, that was easy. That's not difficult at all. Of course it's not that difficult if you take a literal approach. But adopt that eschatology, and then as because I, I, was, I was raised pre-trib, pre-mill at the beginning. Pre-trib just means Jesus comes at the beginning of tribulation. Pre-mill means Jesus comes at the beginning of the millennial kingdom and establishes his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. That's all it means. And I adopted that as a young Christian. Then I went to seminary. Many of my friends were other belief systems, all mill, you know, post mill, all of that stuff. And they said, well, of course you're pre-mill, pre-trib. You've never studied anything, studied anything else. And I said, you know, you're right. And so I took five years where I suspended my conclusions. It's okay to do that. And I said, I'm going to just read and study other guys. And I did. And I came right back to pre-mill, pre-trib. After studying all the other guys, I thought, well, that verse does sound like it could be post-mill until you get to that verse and that verse and that verse. Those are all pre-mill passages. And so I went back to a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial kingdom uh, paradigm. And as I'm reading through the Bible, I never have to force a verse. As I'm reading through the major prophets, the minor prophets, I never have to force a verse into my system because it fits, I think. I think it fits very well. 
Then I have friends who believe, I study scholars, many of the scholars that I study are all millennial. They don't believe there's a literal millennial kingdom. They don't believe there's a literal 1,000 year reign. They believe we're in the millennial kingdom right now. And most of the book of Revelation happened in 70 AD. That's called a partial preterist view. And that right now we're in the millennial kingdom. It's this nondescript, ambiguous time frame. 1,000 years is just figurative. And then when things get really, really bad, Jesus will come back. That's the all-millennial view. Yeah, the Lord will come. Maranatha, come quick, Lord. How long are you going to wait? Well, the problem with that is in chapter 20, you've got thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, like seven times in six verses. What do you do with that? Why would you not take that literally? There's no reason not to take that literally. One of the first rules of Bible interpretation is... If the passage you're reading makes good sense, don't seek any other sense. Stay with the literal sense, unless there's an obvious figure of speech. So anyway, what we have here are mountaintop perspective of certain key events in redemptive history. Last week, we started off by saying the historical events we see here on earth are in reality exhibits of spiritual battles that are taking place in heaven. What we see on earth physically has already had its counterpart take place in the kingdom of God. The Bible says you were pre-known in eternity past. You were predestined in eternity past by God. And everything that's happening here on earth today has all been decreed. It's all been predestined. And even the spiritual battles or the physical battles we see here on earth are literally spiritual battles that took place in heaven first. John said he saw a great sign, huge sign in heaven. The word is Simeon. We said last week, Simeon, the word appears 77 times in the New Testament. And the reality, the importance of the sign is never the sign itself. The sign is always pointing to something greater. People ask me, why do I believe we don't need the miraculous gifts for today? Because the miraculous gifts were signs. They were to authenticate the messenger. I don't need any messenger authenticated today. I have one. The signs were to authenticate the message. I don't need anybody to authenticate the message. I have the message right here in completed form. That's why I don't believe the signs and wonders gifts are for today. If we needed apostles, we would need those signs and wonders and those gifts. We don't. We have the completed text of Scripture. The purpose for those signs does not occur anymore. It does not take place. They're not necessitated by anything. We have the completed Word of God. And I know there are differences of opinions. I have friends that disagree. But the purpose of those was to authenticate the message and the messenger. We don't need Simeons anymore. God can do miracles. I have no problem. I'm going back to Africa in June. If God wants to use one of the people on, on our team to raise the dead, I'm not going to complain about that. If somebody uses somebody on our team to speak in tongues, I, I have no problem with that. Does that person have the permanent gift of tongues? No, I don't think so. If they did, you'd know it. We would see it in church all the time. If somebody had the gift of miracles in your church, you would know it. If somebody had the gift of healings in your church, you would know it. We wouldn't even have this discussion. I don't think we need those miracles and those signs and wonders today. However, I do believe God still does miracles. Don't, don't get me wrong about that. And there are other normal gifts that we need in the church. You see the gift of administration all the time through Goody. You see the gift of um, evangelism all the time through uh, Pastor Gus. You see the gift of pastoring all the time through Pastor Mike. We need those gifts today. Uh, well, thank you for the clarification I, uh, when you said that. It's like, not that, that they do not appear and don't happen. You're just saying that they're not being used as a sign in order to point to Christ. Well, no, I, I think today if, if God raises somebody from the dead on the mission field, it's to authenticate, it's to tell the African people, we're here, we're from God, this is obvious. Now let's get to the real stuff. We're going to teach the word of God. But that's not the most important thing when the guy raised from the dead. He could die anyway again. That's not the most important thing. I've always said if somebody's going to raise somebody from the dead across the street and somebody's going to preach the Bible, I'm going to hear the Bible preach. It doesn't amaze me that God would raise the dead. That doesn't surprise me. It doesn't astonish me. You would probably even expect it on the mission field. But that's not sanctifying. That doesn't make you holy. It's wonderful. That's what sanctifies you is the preaching of the word of God. Long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respects to salvation. 
you know, over and over and over. It's the word of God that restores the soul. It's the word of God that refurbishes. Today, the centrality of church is not signs and wonders. We don't need that stuff anymore. Could it happen? Yeah, we pray for a miracle. A miracle would happen here and there. I, I have no problem with that. I don't think anybody has a gift of miracles. I don't think anybody has the gift of healings. We don't, we don't need that. We've, we've got the word of God. This is what God wants us to focus on. So these signs that appear, John wasn't supposed to stand there and gaze at the sign. It was a greater reality behind that. So anyway, we have the sign here taking place. It's a huge, great sign. Who is she? Well, not to go into detail. We did that last week. In Genesis 37, this exact same verbiage appears. And what happened is the woman is Israel. She is clothed with the sun, and the sun is Jacob. And then under her, the, the woman's feet is the moon. That's depicting Rachel herself. And then she has 12 stars. This woman has 12 stars, 12 crowns on her head. Those are the 12, I'm sorry, I said 12 uh, crowns. She has 12 stars. And those 12 stars are depicting the tribes of Israel. By the way, just so you know, to get these patriarchs right, Abraham had a wife with Sarah. Abraham had a son. His name was um, Jacob. Jacob's wife was Rachel. And then Jacob had a son, and his name was Isaac. You might have that laughter. And he had a wife whose name was Rebekah. These two had the 12 tribes of Israel. Is that, isn't that the other way? Is but, it Abraham begat Isaac? Isaac begat Jacob? Oh, you're yes, right. Yes. You're right, you're right, you're right. Thanks. Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. I'm, I'm, you're right, Abraham, Jacob. <laughs> That's like... Bible 101. Sorry. I knew you were testing this. I, I worked all, I chopped wood all day yesterday. I was making pavers in the hot sun, so I'm a little time. So you're right. Abraham, good job, Nick. Isaac, good job, Nick. Thank you. And Jacob, and J you're right. Wow, really, I really biffed to that one. Uh, and Rebecca. So Abraham and Sarah had Isaac. Isaac married Rebecca. They had a child in Jacob. Jacob married Rachel. And those two, two had the 12 tribes of Israel. Thank you for that. I uh, yeah, I don't want, to, and it's one video too, so everybody knows how bad I messed you're, you're it up. Testing us. Uh, yeah, I was, no, I, was, I was just testing you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so anyway, it says this woman was yearning to give birth to a child for two thousand years. Israel longed and waited for the birth of this Messiah, and with, when the Messiah was born, then this red dragon comes on the scenes. Who is this red dragon? Well, here the dragon is depicting Satan himself. Because we use masculine personal pronouns. He, he, he. He went after the woman. He wanted to person. He wanted to kill the child. He here the dragon, the, the seven-headed, ten-horned dragon is depicting Satan. The seven-headed, ten-horned beast is illustrative of the organized efforts, human efforts that are satanically driven that move against all of, that is of God on the earth. This seven-headed beast appears sometimes as a political system. You'll see that in Revelation 13 again. Sometimes this seven-headed beast is a political system, but it works with this evil religious system on the world to fight against God. This seven-headed beast, we said last week, here is illustrative of Satan, but it has seven heads, and, and, and uh, in this case, we have ten horns and seven diadems. The seven heads are depicting seven nations that have ruled the world. Number one was Egypt. Egypt was the first nation to rule the world. Number two was Assyria. Assyria. Number three was Babylon. Number four was Medo-Persia. Number five was Greece. And as you're going to see here, number six is Rome. And number seven is the revived Roman Empire in the end times. That's going to be the seventh head. The seventh head has to take place. The sixth one has. We had Rome, but the revived Roman Empire is yet to take place. What are these ten horns? Last week we said those ten horns are ten nations on the head of that seventh beast. That revived Roman Empire is going to have ten nations, a ten-nation confederacy that works with the Antichrist to set up this anti-Christian nationalistic fervor, this world religion, this world, one world economy, this one world uh, political system. And, and just in case today you're thinking, oh, gee golly, it's been 2,000 years. It will probably be another 2,000 years. Uh, can I borrow that, that cup here on this water here real quick? Yeah, that doesn't have, um, you know that barcode they want whenever you buy groceries and stuff? 
That's called the UPC code. I studied that at DeVry Institute of Technology. Did you know, you know, you've got all those barcodes, and then when you've got two numbers that come down, each number is represented by two bars. We're going somewhere with this. You're going to like this. The middle number and the end number, they all go down below. The first, the middle, and the last number all go down below all the others. You know what that first number is? Six. It's six. Do you know what that middle number is? Six. It's six. Do you know what the end number is? Six. It's six. Mm -hmm. You already have 666 on everything you buy and sell. Everything that's got that barcode on it has 666. And the hexadecimal system, the guy was asked, why did you pick 666? And he said, well, in the hexadecimal system, this is what six is. You have one, twos, fours, and eights. You have a two, you have a four, that's the number six. He said it's bisymmetrical. It tells the computer when to stop, when we're in the middle, and when we're at the end. Well, that sounds cute, but so is nine. The number nine is bisymmetrical also. You have a one, no twos, no fours, and one eight. That's nine. That's bisymmetrical too. You have 666 on everything you buy and sell today. We're not that far, folks. I don't know how I'm when Jesus is coming, but you already have Revelation 13 fulfillment. You got 666 on everything. And well, the next thing is that it's going to be on us. You're going to need 666 to buy and sell. So the revived Roman Empire. <coughs> Is this like so? This is is this why people think that the Pope could be the Antichrist? That Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, has. I don't know if it's going to be the Roman Catholic Church. If it was, it did. It wouldn't surprise me. Turn to uh, Daniel chapter nine. I will tell you this: whoever this guy is, he is a Roman. Whoever this Antichrist is, he's a Roman. D Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. Uh, let's see, where is my passage? There we go, 926. Uh, we talked about this months ago, but after the 62 weeks, that is after the 7 weeks plus the 62 weeks of Daniel's 70 weeks, after that 69th week, the 62 weeks is 7 plus 62. That 69th week, the Messiah will be cut off. That's when Christ was crucified at the end of those 62 weeks. And he will have nothing, and the people, uh, catch this, the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, who destroyed Israel in 70 AD? It was the Romans. So they are the people of the prince who is to come. The prince who is to come is a Roman. So is he ruling out of Rome? Is he the Pope? I have no idea. He's a political figure. Mm -hmm. I kind of don't think he is the Pope because you're going to see in Revelation 17, the political system of the seventh head ends up destroying the woman, the false religious uh, woman that rides on the back of the beast. So it's not a religious system that rules. It's a military political system that rules the world. That 10 nation feder confederacy, those 10 horns on that seventh head, Turn against the religious system, that woman who rides on its back. And you'll see that in Revelation 17. So I'm not convinced that it's going to be the Catholics or the, the Pope and all of that. It's going to be a political and a, and a military system. You'll see that. So that's what the seven heads are. They are seven nations. Six of them have already taken place. The seventh one, revived Roman Empire, has taken place. Ten crowns are the ten crowns on that seventh head. They all work together throughout the world. I was raised thinking that there are 10 European, European yeah. nation confederacy. I'm not convinced of that. I don't see that in scripture anywhere. It could be Canada, South America, North America, and China, and Russia giving all their power to the Antichrist. I don't know who it is. I'm not convinced anybody does. But it's that 10 nation confederacy at the end of times. You'll see that. Then, of course, here we have uh, seven uh, diadems. Those seven crowns are on each one of those beast's heads. When we get to Revelation 13, there are going to be ten crowns. Those ten crowns are going to each be on one of those ten horns. They're all ruling political leaders. So let's turn to uh, chapter 13 real quick. I want to read that for you. Here's This is where we see the seven-headed, ten-horned beast in Revelation. Revelation 12, Revelation 13... Revelation 17. And he, that is the dragon, on chapter 13, verse 1, Revelation, he stood on the sand of the seashore, and I saw a beast 
coming up out of the sea. Sea in Revelation usually denotes nations and peoples. Coming up out of the sea of humanity, having ten horns, seven heads. Here's the beast again. And this time, ten horns, not seven horns. I'm sorry, uh, uh, ten horns, seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems. In Revelation chapter 12, it was seven diadems. Here it's ten. Well, it's because each horn has a crown on it. And his heads, and on his heads were blasphemous names, probably names claiming to be deity. This Antichrist is a megalomaniac. He is the narcissist to the nth degree, and he, he outlaws all religion in the end times, the last three and a half years on earth, because he puts himself in the temple as being God. First Thessalon or Second Thessalonians chapter two. He puts himself and his image in the temple. He wants to be worshipped as God. That's why that ten nation confederation that works with him to give him his power, they kill the religious scarlet uh, beast that's riding on top of this seven-headed animal. I'll show you that in a second. And the beast, that is this seven-headed beast, which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like those of a bear, mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave his power. This is the Antichrist. Christ gave his power, or gave him power, and his throne, and the great authority. So you have the Antichrist empowering this beast. That's why this beast at times is likened to a political system. He's likened to a political leader. He's likened to, the, or to Satan himself, because they all work together in conjunction and cooperation. So they're all considered one spiritual entity. And then verse 3, I saw one of the heads as if it had been slain. The seven-headed beast, the seventh head, was slain at one point, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. And the same way that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, this Antichrist is going to claim to have a false resurrection. You can read more about that down in verse 14 of chapter 13. But verse 4 and they worshiped the world, worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. The uh, devil gave his authority to the beast, saying, who's like the beast and who's able to wage war with him? Nobody can wage war with him because he has all the militaries of the world. And, and nobody, nobody can fight against him because he has all the major militaries of the world. So who would dare pick a fight with this guy? Revelation chapter 17, we'll go through that quick. We did that last week, we'll go through it quick. Good grief, we're at 1030 already, we're still in review. And one of the seven angels had the seven bowls, came up and spoke with me, um, and said, come here, I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. This religious prostitute who controls all the false religions of the world to deceive them. Verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with, her, with the wine of, of her immorality. So the kings of the earth are working in political alliance with this religious woman who's deceiving the whole world. Verse 3, he carried me away in the spirit and the wilderness. I saw a woman. This is a religious woman to deceive the peoples of the world. She was sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemies, names having seven and uh, uh, blasphemous names having seven heads and ten horns. So this religious woman rides on this seven-headed beast, this political beast, to propagate herself around the world, and she brings more fame and fortune to this seven head on this beast. And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet. She was very rich, adorned with gold, precious stones, pearls, having in her hand a cup of full of abominations and the unclean things of her immorality. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon, the Great, the Mother of Harlots and of the Abominations of the Earth. She represents all false religions around the world. She promotes anything that is anti-God, anti-Christ. Saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. She's a murderous woman. She kills true believers in Christ. She was drunk with the blood of the, uh, of, the, of the witnesses of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast, this is the seven-headed beast, ten horn, that you saw was, that is Rome, is not currently, but it's about to come back again, about ready to come out of the abyss to go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth will wonder, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast, this seven-headed beast, he was, he is not, and he will come again. 
Here's the mind which has wisdom. Seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sits. Verse 10, they are seven kings, five have fallen. Which ones? Egypt, Assyria, <coughs> Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. Five of those seven heads have already gone down. The sixth one, Rome, existed at that time. It says uh, the five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. That's the revived Roman Empire. But when he does come, he'll be there for a little while, means for a little while. Verse 11, the beast, which was and is not, is himself also an eighth. Now he's the Antichrist. And as one of the seven, he goes to destruction. This beast, I believe, rules the world as the seventh head in, con in conjunction with this ten-nation confederacy, these ten horns. But at one point, he rejects all other political systems, and he himself, for the last three and a half years, rules the entire earth by himself. I believe that's where that eighth head comes from. It's a political leader. Uh, verse 12, And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom. They're going to happen in the future when that revived old Roman Empire comes into existence. They've not yet received the kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. The beast gives them authority. They have one purpose, that is to give their power and authority to the beast. This ten-nation confederation gives all of its power and authority and its military might and its political fame and success to the Antichrist. Verse 14, they will wage war against the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them. This is in the tribulation period now because he is Lord of Lord, King of Kings, and those who are, on, those who are with him are, called the, are the called and chosen and faithful. Verse 15, he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits, this is the woman who's on the back of this political beast, are peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. She rides upon the popularity and the fame that these false religious people all over the world give to this false religious woman who represents all false religions around the world. Verse 16, the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot. So the Antichrist and these other ten nations hate this religious woman. They can't stand her. They will hate the harlot. They will make her desolate, naked, will eat her flesh, and burn her up with fire. So they're going to destroy this false religious woman in the tribulation period. They take all the political power, all the economical power, and all the military power unto themselves and give it to the Antichrist. He now is the God of this world, ruling, reigning with his image in the temple in Jerusalem. He is a megalomaniac. Verse 17, God put it in their heart to execute his purpose by having a common purpose. They all come together. They hate this harlot. And they give their kingdom to the beast. These ten nations give their kingdoms to the Antichrist until the words of God should be fulfilled. And the woman who you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So this religious woman will have a, a religious city somewhere on the world. Yes. So he would be the head of the new, the new world order. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, what, what airlines? That United Airlines now says one world. Uh, there's a, there's airlines now. I mean, you're you're hearing it more, more and more and more. One world, one world, one world. It's all coming to the, together really, really quickly, really quickly. Let's go back to Daniel. I want to show you some things in Daniel chapter two. Good grief! Where did the time go, folks? <laughs> I hope it went fast for you. <laughs> I don't like, it, it, it's not a good sign when time goes fast for me, but not fast for you. Uh, in seminary, I was always taught, how, how long should you preach? Well, my response was, a bad sermon is always too long, yep. and a good sermon is always too short. <laughs> you pick from there. Didn't the Apostle Paul preach all night? He preached all night, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> Yeah, until Eutychus fell out the window. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31 through 45. Daniel 2, 31 through 45. Nebuchadnezzar is king. Daniel is in Babylon. He is called an exilic prophet because he is in exile after the Babylonian captivity. He is there with the Jews for 70 years. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has a dream. He's really disturbed. So he calls his magicians, the Chaldeans, the wise men, and says, tell me the dream, tell me its meaning, and I won't kill all of you, because you're really starting to annoy me. I think you're a bunch of frauds. And they said, well, tell us the dream, and we'll give you interpretation. He says, no, 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 because you have already agreed to sneak off to the back room in the kitchen somewhere and agree to some interpretation. You're going to come out and lie to me. So I, you're going to tell me the dream. And they say, nobody can tell the king's dream. And one guy says, yeah, there's Daniel. 
So Daniel comes in, he says, Nebuchadnezzar, let me tell you the dream and its interpretation to show that I'm of God. And this is it, verse 31. You, O king, says Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar, you were looking, behold, there was a single great statue. That statue was large, of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. 32. The head of that statue was made of fine gold. Its breasts, its arms of silver, its belly and thighs were bronze, its legs were of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So each of these metals has a descending value, <coughs> but an increasing measure of strength. Bronze is stronger than gold. Silver is stronger than gold. But iron is, is less valuable, but it's stronger than silver and bronze and gold. So you have decreasing value of nations, but increasing political and military strength. Verse 34, you continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the statue on, on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. So the statue was stuck, cut out of the stone without human hands and crushed the feet, which were iron and clay. We're going to explain all this in a second. Then the iron, the clay, and the bronze, and the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and they became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. What would happen was the Jews would take their, their grain up on top of a high hill and they would have cattle run a, a wheel over top of it and the grain would be separated from the chaff. Then they would take a fork and they'd throw it in the air and the wind would blow the chaff away and all the grain would be left behind. So that's what it means when Peter, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat, to blow away the chaff and leave left behind what is truly valuable. Uh, silver stone, but then the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Verse 36, this was a dream. Now we shall tell its interpretation. So King, that's the dream you saw. The statue, head of gold, uh, uh, silver, and then bronze, and then iron, and iron and clay mixed. That was a dream, O King. Now here's the interpretation. King, you're the one. You're the man with the gold. Uh, you, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven was given the kingdom, who God of heaven has given the kingdom and the power and the strength and its glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell or the beasts of the field or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand, Nebuchadnezzar, and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. You're the king of Babylon. You are the head of gold. Now after you, there's going to be another kingdom. It's going to be silver. It's inferior. And that's going to be Medo-Persia. That's the Medo-Persian Empire, it's the silver. And then the bronze <coughs> is going to come after the silver, which will rule over the, all the earth. And the bronze is illustrative uh, of Greece. The belly and the thighs are bronze. The breast is silver. The belly and the thighs are, are bronze. And they illustrate Greece. Then there will be a fourth kingdom, as strong as iron. This is Rome. As strong as iron, and as much as iron crushes and shatters all things so like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these things in pieces. And in that you saw the feet and the toes, ten nation confederacy, feet and toes here, revived Roman Empire. There's iron, but it is mixed with clay. Iron legs, Rome. Iron and clay feet, revived Roman Empire. Partly of the potter's clay, partly of iron. It will be a divided kingdom, but it will have its toughness of iron inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. And the toes of the feet were partly of iron, partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. These ten toes illustrate this ten-nation confederacy in the end times. They will not have a strong consolidation. They will not be strongly united politically. Possibly they're forced together by the Antichrist. But it's iron and clay. And as you can imagine, iron and clay do not cohese. Or, or they're not very cohesive. They don't bond together. And so this ten-nation confederacy at the end days and the last times will be a loose confederation of nations. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay. They will combine with one another in the seed of men. That means nations, ethnicities from all over the world. But they will not adhere to one another even as iron does not combine with pottery. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never. That is, at the end of the tribulation, Christ is coming back in Revelation 19, and he's going to set up his everlasting kingdom. 
In those days of those kings of God, uh, in those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. Why? Because it's for God's people, nobody else. This kingdom, this millennial kingdom, will be for God's people. It will crush and put an end to all of these kingdoms, but it itself will endure forever. The millennial period of uh, Christ upon earth, ruling physically now upon the earth after the tribulation. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain with hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true. Its interpretation is trustworthy. The stone, of course, as you can probably figure out by now, is Christ himself. He's cut out, not by human hands. He is ordained. He is created by God to sit down to earth to destroy all the kingdoms of this world that are in revolt against God himself. And he is going to rule and reign in that millennial kingdom for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, there will be one final revolt. There will be one final uprising. And after that uprising, Christ will rise up, defend his people, destroy all evil, and he will judge them. At the end, the end of the millennial kingdom is what we call the great white throne judgment. You can see that in Revelation chapter 20. At the great white throne judgment, uh, demons are thrown into the lake of fire, into hell. Hell doesn't exist right now. There is no hell right now. It's all Hades. Every, every non-believer goes into Hades. Every demon that is incarcerated goes into a place called Tartarus or the abyss. Remember in the Gadarene, the Gadarene demoniac, the, the legion said, don't throw us into the abyss yet. And we'll, okay, go into those pigs. The abyss is the temporary holding place of demons. Hades is the temporary holding place of non-believers. They're both resurrected. Christ judges non-believers at the end of the millennial kingdom at the great wine throne judgment, and they're all thrown into hell. Now hell exists. And all believers, of course, are ruling and reigning in the millennial kingdom, and God creates a new heavens and a new earth, brand new earth, brand new heavens, brand new universe. Everything's brand new. Nothing is tainted with sin. Parenthetical note, hell, the first two people in hell are the Antichrist and his false prophet. When Christ comes uh, in Revelation 19 down to earth to establish a millennial kingdom, he judges the sheep and the goats. You goats, you go, into, you go into Hades, and you sheep, you go into the millennial kingdom, populate the kingdom, have babies, and make nations. We're going to rule and reign over you. But at that point, the Antichrist and his false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. They're the first two people in hell at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. They're down there by themselves for a thousand years. And then at the end of the thousand years, at the great white throne judgment, all non-believers are resurrected out of Hades. And death and Hades themselves are thrown into the lake of fire. Death is the principle of death. Hades is the abode of the dead, the spiritual dead. So we started off by saying, what are the two sources of evil? Number one, man's sin. Number two, demons. And in the book of Revelation, you have a consolidation of men and demons working together to, to thrust God in his son, Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are all powerless. As human beings, we are absolutely powerless against all these spiritual forces. The only two things we have to counteract are the Bible and the Holy Spirit. In your humanity, you are no match for a demon. You are no match for Satan. You are no match for his deception. But when we're born again, we get the Holy Spirit who helps us to illuminate the word of God, to understand the word of God. And now we can set, successfully battle all those forces of evil. And we can begin, begin to go out into the kingdom of darkness of this world and rescue people through the power of the gospel. Through the power of the gospel. We don't need movie stars. We don't need rock stars. We don't need famous people to spread the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Paul said, because it is the power of God into salvation. The, the most innocent little 12-year-old girl has all the power she needs to lead hundreds of people to Christ because she has the power of the gospel. The power is in the gospel. Not in the messenger, but in the message itself. So don't be afraid to preach the gospel to people. You have all the power. You've got the Holy Spirit, and you've got the message that is the power itself. Quick questions or comments? That was really fast. I apologize. The whole first half of it was uh, really review from last week. Try, try to get into Daniel. Next week, we're going to go into Daniel chapter 7. There's more there about the Antichrist and this kingdom that's going to take place at the end times. There's more there that we need to know about it. Then we'll move forward. We'll see that battle with the woman that takes place. And he wanted to devour the child. 
and she sought refuge. Uh, what, is, what does all that mean? You know, this woman ran for refuge for three and a half years. We'll, we'll discuss what all that means. So any quick questions or any quick comments? That was fast. I apologize, Nick. So does the Antichrist has this fake resurrection? Yes. And then the, the, it almost seems like religion, these false religions are being used as this false sign. And then after the three and a half years is up, the Antichrist and the kingdoms have had their used religion enough. And so they kick it out. Because yep. now the deceptions. That's Revelation 17. That false religion, it's all gone. He stands up and says, your religions are no longer valid. I am God. And I, I don't have time to show you that, but I can show you next week. He'll, he'll, he'll want to be worshipped as God. That's how much of an egomaniac he is. Yeah. Thank you for bearing with that. I hope some of that made sense. Like I said, a lot of it was reviewed from last week. I didn't plan on spending that much time on review. But at least we got into Daniel 2. We'll read Daniel 7 next week, and then we'll move forward in the chapter, okay? Let's uh, close in prayer. Lord, we're grateful. Um, what a terrifying thing it would be if we did not know the future. But as your children, you have graced us with the delight of knowing what is going to take place. And once again, we rejoice in our salvation. You've not only rescued us from terror and from horror, but you've rescued us from the punishments of sin. Through Christ's death on the cross, we have been freed from our incarceration to sin. We have been freed from our incarceration to deceit. And now we are free to understand you, know you, love you, and serve you. Father, may we be found faithful as servants of Christ, faithfully serving until the day you take us home or the day you come to get us into rapture. Uh, bless our day, Lord. This is the Lord's day. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.